Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Palm Sunday service. So this is our third online service. And you never know, by the time we get through all of this, we may even be experts at this. I think if someone had said six months ago that we'd be doing online services, we would not have believed them. And yet here we are. So as I said, it's Palm Sunday today and Chris will be bringing the message to us a bit later on. We're going to be hearing from Amanda and also from Nick and Emily um, today. Lynn is going to be leading us in prayer. Shona is going to be sharing a poem and Mike has put together a worship set. So it's going to be good. But before we jump into it, um, let's let's pray, shall we? Because we want God to meet us where we are this morning and we need him to fill us with his spirit and we need him to bring unity even though we are um, all separated out at the moment and we're all in different houses. So, so let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you that we can meet together in this new way. And we want to invite you right now into our homes, right where we are. Would you meet each one of us where we are, Lord? Would you open our hearts to you? And would you fill us afresh with your spirit, Lord? We ask that you would fill us with that peace that transcends understanding as we come to you this morning. And we commit this time to you. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. So a good number of you were at our Church Away Day last year. And if you remember, we were looking at change and transformation and we reflected on the fact that change is not easy. And you might remember that I, I talked to you about a model that can be really helpful as you're going through change. And so I thought, given the fact that right now we are all going through tremendous changes, given the current coronavirus pandemic situation, um, that it would just be useful to, to give a quick recap of that, that model. And so it was the William Bridges transition model, if that might ring a bell. Um, and, and what Bridges said was that change is fast. And we know that we have experienced very recently, literally overnight, um, the way that we live our lives has changed dramatically. It was very, very fast. That's change. Change happens fast. Transition, on the other hand, is a three stage psychological process that people go through as they internalize and come to terms with the new situation that the change has brought about. And the starting point for transition isn't the outcome, it isn't the change, the starting point is the ending that you have to make to leave the old situation behind. And so just as a reminder, here is Bridget's model, as you can see, three stage process which is not linear. Um, transition begins with an ending, a losing and a letting go period. And then you get plunged into what Bridges called the neutral zone, which is the in-between time when the old has gone, but the new isn't yet fully operational. And then finally, the new beginning where people come out of the transition and they make a new beginning. Um, for today, I wanted us to focus on the first two stages really because each and every one of us has experienced an ending or endings because of the current um, coronavirus pandemic. We can no longer meet together. We can no longer visit friends and family. Many of us can no longer go out to work and we're working from home. Some of you have lost your jobs. Some of you can't work. Some of you are unable to leave your homes even for the one exercise a day that we're permitted. What we used to do, we can no longer do. These are endings and endings are hard. And right now we find ourselves immersed in what Bridges calls the neutral zone, the messy, trying to work out what the new normal looks like, neutral zone. Bridges uh, said that the neutral zone was a state of affairs in which neither the old ways nor the new ways work satisfactorily. He called it a nowhere between two somewheres. Um, he said the old way of doing things is gone, but the new way doesn't yet feel comfortable. So I just wanted to bring this model to you again as encouragement, really. And, and to say that it's perfectly normal 
to feel a bit up and down, to not feel yourself at the moment, to have bad days and to have sad days. And it got me thinking about Moses when he led the Israelites out of Egypt. And they went through their own neutral zone as they passed through the wilderness and they actually displayed typical neutral zone behaviours. And here are some of the things that, that they said. So when the Israelites saw that Pharaoh's armies had caught up with them, they said, this is in chapter 14 of Exodus. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So here the Israelites, they're afraid and so they grumble and they complain. Um, and straight after this, God provides a way out and he makes a way through the sea. And then a little bit later on in Exodus chapter 16, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat round pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Again, um, they're afraid. And um, interesting, after this, God provides the manna and the quail. I could go on, but you get the picture, don't you? Lots of grumbling and quarrelling and um, complaining in the desert. And this is typical neutral zone behaviour, arguably born out of fear. And the wonderful thing is that in each of these examples, God provided um, God didn't desert the Israelites in their messy neutral zone and he hasn't deserted us either. He provides. And I love the fact that one of the things that God says to his people again and again through scripture is do not fear. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. That's from Luke chapter 12. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That's from John chapter 14. And then one of my personal favourites. I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. That's Isaiah chapter 41 verse 13. So as we go through this time of lockdown, let's be aware of what's driving our behaviour. And if we find ourselves grumbling or getting a bit short with the people that we live with, let's recognise it for what it is. Let's um, bring it to God and let's take hold of God's promise to us. I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says, do not fear, I will help you. So we're now going to hear from Amanda and Nick and Emily about how current circumstances are affecting them. Hello, my rural Baptist family. I know it's been a little while since we've seen each other, but I love and miss all of you just as much as I'm sure you all love and miss me. Um, this is going to be a little bit weird because I'm not very good at talking to the camera, but Chris asked me a couple of questions that I am now going to attempt to answer. Uh, so the first question is, how is this situation affecting me and my family? Uh, so for us here in England, um, things have changed a little bit. Not so much for mom, because she typically spends the day at home, but Seth's classes are 100% online now. He has to be logged in from something like 8 to 3 every day, which is a little annoying for everyone, but gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, dad is working from home twice a week. He probably won't go to a full five-day schedule at home just because his role is considered essential on base. But with how crazily things have been changing, anything is possible. Um, Sean is in Texas. He's in the middle of, of leaving the army. So that happening at the same time as this virus is causing a little bit of or a little bit more stress and anxiety than um, normal. So if you could just keep him in your prayers. Other than that, he's healthy. 
Um, my older brother is doing well, staying home, staying safe. The same for uh, my grandmothers, both in California. They are keeping away from people as best they can. And I am working from home, which leads me to my the next question that I have to answer, which is how is the situation affecting uh, Youth for Christ? So obviously we work with youth and about 90% of our work is done in um, a school context. So this first, like this is a bit weird, but the first full week of the school closure has been a bit like half term. Um, we're all working from home. Nobody but Jerry's going into the office just to keep everybody safe. Uh, so we spent that first week just in prayer. Um, pray for safety for everyone, for everyone's health, as well as um, for direction, what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to go about things, how we can stay connected and engaged with the young people that we have been building relationships with for the last school year and, and beyond that. Um, we've been having daily team Zoom meetings. Uh, we started off with about a 10 minute thought that someone, that one of us, someone brings. Um, we then discuss like uh, the technicalities of what we're gonna do, um, bounce ideas off each other, and then close in prayer. We have been praying for specific people as well as uh, the other Youth for Christ centers throughout the country. Um, but if there are any specific prayers, that you have. If you email us, we'll pray for you. So right now we're looking into um, how we can still engage with the young people through social media. Uh, the most accessible platform to us right now, safeguarding wise, is Instagram. So we're looking at um, video sessions that we can do, live worship sessions, pre-recorded worship sessions, uh, a thought or verse of the week, Right now, um, Kim is working out a, a video session that she had the idea to do after our live weekend. Um, so it's all just about collating the information, getting it edited, making it look as professional as possible, and then actually putting it out there and seeing how the young people respond to it and engage with it. Um, as most of us are working at home, we're, or no, all of us are working from home, um, people are having to juggle between taking care of their families and taking care of work stuff. So for people like Kim and Hannah, who are still raising their kids, they um, are having to find a balance. So if you could pray for them, that would be awesome. Um, but also for me, because I'm just aware that I have to be done working with Youth for Christ by like the second week of July. Uh, so it's very, very, very 99.9% .9 likely that I won't ever see um, a lot of these kids again, especially in this capacity. Um, and I'm struggling with that a bit, but that is, if that's what, if that's what is, like the Lord's plan, then that's the Lord's plan, and I just have to suck it up and deal with it. Um, I have grown very attached to them, so it is proving to be a little more uh, difficult. So if you could pray for peace in this time for me specifically, um, as well as patience for everybody else, uh, health and safety for everyone else, we would really really appreciate it. I love and miss all of you guys. I cannot wait to see you. I hate being stuck in the house. <laughs> Good evening. Hi everyone. Susan's asked us to answer a few questions for this week's Sunday service. The first one being, how is this crisis affecting us as a family? Um, I think the main thing with a crisis at the moment is I'm not working. Yeah. Um, you know, event companies you know, I make I make furniture for event companies, and they, as you know, as you know, but 
the events have all been cancelled for this year, so that's put a bit of a a brick wall against it. Um, well, you know, I suppose we've... But it does mean you can be off with Freya. Yeah, Which is that's good, true. so she doesn't have to be at school. Um, I'm still working, frontline NHS, so that's fun and games. Um, it's challenging in lots of different ways, very different to how it normally is, but we are just taking things day by day and having to change and reassess and react to all the latest updates that come out. Um, yes, so that's um, yes, interesting in its own way. Teaching Freya has been fun as well. Yes, mm -hmm. you've not that's, particularly enjoyed homeschooling. No, have you? that's not my um, not my forte in life, but mm -hmm. you know, it needs must, I suppose. But. She's enjoying time with you on her own, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah she is. Yeah. And the second question is, how is it affecting our wider family? Um, your parents are well enough to look after themselves, aren't they, in Norfolk? Yeah, they're and following fine. all yeah. the social distancing rules, which yeah. is really good, and they're pretty self sufficient, so they're doing well. And your brother and sister and their families are all able to work from home, aren't they? Yes, yeah. And everyone's well so far. Yeah. Um, and my side of the family, obviously mum and dad are <laughs> doing really well. Um, but my mum's brother, Neil, is obviously very vulnerable with his MS. And at the moment, he again is doing fine and his carers are looking after him well. But if they are poorly, then that is going to get difficult for him. So, um, yeah, please bear him in your thoughts. And the last question was... How are we maintaining our discipleship? I think mainly at the moment is we're, you know, really listening to Christian music at the moment and, you know, in the forefront of everything that's going on, I suppose we've got to, you know, really kind of focus on, on God at the moment and he is the one that's in control and he's, and um, just really, just really focus on the fact that, you know, there is a way out of this and, no one knows how long it's going to go on for, but it's, um, I think we've... You know. Yeah, we were talking to Frey the other day how, um, you know, the maps might seem there's mountains and there's valleys and there's storms in the world and all sorts, but it's still God's map. So whatever happens is still under his control, um, even if we can't understand why or make any sense of it at all. Um, yeah, we've had some quite interesting conversations with mm. haven't we? Yeah. Um, right. all missing the routine of church and seeing yeah. each other um but it's temporary so we will keep on keeping on otherwise yes all done yeah, all done huh? bye. Yeah. Bye. okay take care everyone see bye. you soon bye bye shall we just pray for uh the hughes family and also for for nick and and em and, and freya Lord, we thank you for the Hughes family, for bringing them to us at just the right time. And we pray for Tim, Ellie, Amanda, Seth, Sean and Andrew, for your continued protection over them. We ask that you would give Sean your peace in the stress and anxiety that he's feeling right now, that he would know you as his rescuer in that situation. We pray for Amanda that you would fill her with your peace as she faces the prospect of not seeing the young people that she has built relationships with ever again. You are the God who restores, the God who says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. And Lord, you see all that Amanda has given and you, your promise to her is that good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over. We pray for your continued protection over the Youth for Christ team and your continued direction. We thank you that you lead us in the right paths for your name's sake. That is your promise. And we ask that you would inspire the team to work in new ways, that during this time more and more young people will connect with them. And Lord, we thank you for Nick and Emily and Freya, for the way that you have poured out your healing and provision over them. We're so thankful to you, Lord. And we thank you for the way that this situation has meant that Nick can spend more time with Freya, that you are restoring the years the locusts have eaten. We pray for your continued protection and shielding over them. We ask that you would equip Emily, that you would fill her with your strength and courage as she faces new challenges at work. Thank you for health in the wider family, Lord. 
We do lift up Neil to you and we ask your protection over him and his carers too, Lord. And thank you for that lovely picture of the map with the mountains and the valleys and the storms. And it is still your map, Lord. And we thank you and just, we just, yeah, may your kingdom come, Lord. Amen. So Lynn is now going to lead us in a time of, of, um, of prayer. Today, we remember Jesus setting his face towards Jerusalem in the full knowledge of what lay ahead. Nothing was able to throw him off course. He did not waver in his purpose or hesitate for a minute to continue on that path. Let us walk with him this week, knowing that he is ever interceding for us at the right hand of God, knowing also that he is the one who has opened the way for us to bring our hopes, fears, prayers and petitions to the God who is compassionate and gentle and rich in love. Let's pray for ourselves and for others. Lord, we have no claim on your love, but we seek it nonetheless. Lord, we have no claim on your help, but we ask for it all the same. We have no claim on your mercy, but we beg you to grant it. We have no claim on your blessing, but we need it as never before. Lord, we have no claim on your healing power, but we cry out, cry out for you to pour it out. Lord, we have no claim, no claim on you at all. For too often we forget you, dismiss you, ignore you, scarcely spare you a second thought. Forgive us, Lord. But we need you now so much more than words can say. Undeserving though we may be, faithless and fickle in so much, hear us, help us and heal us, we pray. In the next section of prayer, I invite you to join in wherever you are. After each sentence, I will pause for you to mention by name the people that you know to whom it applies. Then we'll say together, Lord, hold them and help them. Reach out today, Lord, to the frightened, anxious about so many issues for themselves and for their loved ones. together, Lord, hold them and help them. Reach out today, Lord, to the isolated, the lonely and the vulnerable. Lord, hold them and help them. Reach out to the sick, those wrestling with the symptoms of coronavirus and whose situation is complicated by underlying health conditions. Lord, hold them and help them. Reach out to those ministering to the afflicted, offering support, comfort and treatment as best they can, but hampered by limited resources and the scale of the crisis. Give them courage, wisdom, 
strength and protection. Lord, hold them and help them. Reach out to the bereaved, those already mourning family and friends, their love and companionship snatched away. Lord, hold them and help them. Reach out to those affected financially, Lord, those who have lost jobs and livelihoods, the future they took for granted, now under threat. Lord, hold them and help them. Reach out to the countries of our world most affected, Lord, and the many places elsewhere in the world seeing an increase in infections and facing imminent catastrophe in turn. Let's name those places on our hearts now. Lord, hold them and help them. Reach out, Lord, to a world in need, a world in chaos, to your world in disorder and confusion. Lord, hold them and help them. Lord, hold us and help us all. In our fear, Lord, be our confidence. In our weakness, be our strength. In our panic, be our calm. In our sickness, be our healing. In our confusion, be our anchor. In our insecurity, Lord, be our rock. In our darkness, be our light. In our grief, be our comfort. In our despair, be our hope. In our storm, Lord, be our peace. Amen. Amen, and thank you, Lynn. Um, so Shona is now going to share a Palm Sunday poem with us and then I'll do the reading for this morning. Hosanna, Hosanna they called, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, cheering, running, waving, shouting, praising God. Everyone wanted to see him, to see the miracle maker Jesus. There was joy in the celebration. A royal pathway lay ahead, a pathway to his destiny, a destiny of selflessness of which the crowd had yet no understanding. How could they? How could they understand? This man was the cornerstone, El Shaddai, Prince of Peace, and yet he smiled at them with a heart full of love, preparing to take from them all their sins, prepared to continue on that pathway to the cross. Thank you, Shona. So um, the reading today is taken from John chapter 12, verses 12 to, to 19. So John chapter 12, 12 to 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion, see, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this, only after Jesus was glorified 
Did they realise that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him? Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. So I'm going to hand over to Chris now, but before I do, let's let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Chris and for what you've put on his heart to share with us today. Lord, we ask that you would open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to all that you have to say to us. Amen. Thanks, Susan, and to all those involved in this week's Worship at Home service. Today is Palm Sunday, the Sunday we remember the triumphal entry of Jesus to Jerusalem. We intended today to be an all-age service. The donkey usually gets one of her twice yearly outings. I did think about taking her for a walk, uh, but I thought the government guidance probably didn't cover walking the church donkey. Palm Sunday is one of those topics that comes around every year, so ministers get a bit creative, try to think of a new angle, uh, looking at it from different perspectives, including the donkey. I imagine someone has even looked at it from the perspective of the palm leaves being ripped off the tree, shaken about, trampled. Some of us might feel a bit like that this year. I'm going to focus on the passage we heard read from John's Gospel. Uh, John is the longest gospel. It's hard to do a series on the whole book, so I like to look at John at times like Palm Sunday. John is looking back from a greater distance than, say, Mark. As we read through Mark's Gospel, we noticed how action-packed and abrupt it was. John is more reflective. In today's passage, he says, At first, the disciples didn't understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Let's unpack that a little. The events that took place during Jesus' entry to Jerusalem were prophesied ahead of time. John quotes Psalm 118, 25 to 26 and Zechariah 9 verse 9. One of the things I'm indebted to Tom Wright for is explaining that when the Jewish New Testament writers quote a verse from the Old Testament, it's intended to like operate like a mental hyperlink. You know those little things that you click on and it opens a whole website. They quote a verse or two, but they expect the audience to know the passage off by heart and hence to get all the significance of the passage, not just those couple of verses. That's hard for us because we don't often know these passages off by heart. So, for example, let me read Psalm 118, which John quoted a couple of verses from. Let's listen to it, thinking about the triumphal entry and the events that follow. So this is Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me, he is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than trust in princes. All the nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They surround me on every side, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They swarm around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord I cut them off. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live 
and proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. And the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God. He has made the light shine upon us. His, with bows in hand, join the festal pr procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, I will give thanks. You are my God, I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Really ties in with uh, the whole of what's happening through Holy Week and, and through the, the resurrection and beyond. Zechariah and chapter 9, uh, the prophecy is admittedly uh, more obviously focused on the situation the prophet originally spoke to, but there are some really interesting verses in the same chapter. So verse 11, for example, As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. Then in verse 16, the Lord their God will save his people on that day as a shepherd saves his flock. They will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. So the prophet was inspired to speak to the people at that time, the people they lived among and the situations that they faced. But because God is eternal and sees the end from the beginning, there are foreshadowings of his work through Jesus. The prophet reveals something of the eternal purposes of God, even when bringing a specific word to a specific situation. That's why their words are preserved in the Bible. As John reflects on these events, and the things that took place, he wants us to think about these passage, passages of scripture and what God is saying through them. To think about them in the light of the events of Jesus' life. The light bulb moment for John and the other disciples was when Jesus was glorified. The glorification of Jesus is a key theme in John's Gospel, occurring 12 times. Jesus' life is described in relation to this key moment. We slowly come to understand that Jesus' glorification is in and through his death. It is this shocking revelation that John wants us to grasp. As Jesus is rejected, condemned, humiliated, despised and scorned by the world, God is glorifying him. As we look back, we can see that at the cross, the glory of God and his love for us is revealed and it changes how we see what went before and all that comes after. With his resurrection and ascension, Jesus receives again the glory that was his before the world began, and he enters this glory through his sacrificial death. Now, let's put those two thoughts back together again. So, looking back after the death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the disciples understood how Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Psalm 118 and Zechariah 9. Not only in that they cried out, Lord save us, Hosanna, with bows in hand, and he rode a donkey, but also that he was the stone that was rejected, that became the capstone, that through the covenant of his blood he freed the prisoners from the waterless pit and called out the prisoners of hope, opening the gates of righteousness and becoming our salvation. Or as John puts it in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 10, which comes in a passage which looks a lot like a heavenly triumphal entry. 
Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. This is what the disciples glimpsed when they looked back in the light of Jesus at the events of one day in first century Jerusalem involving a donkey, some palm leaves and a lot of shouting kids. At first the disciples didn't understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. There are two encouragements in this verse. Firstly, the disciples had no idea of the significance of the events at the time. Secondly, when they look back afterwards, they realise the significance. So let's apply that to our situation today. In our everyday lives, we often drift along oblivious to the significance of what's unfolding around us. But we're invited to reflect on the events in the light of the glorified Jesus. This requires us to read the Bible and remember our experiences. Then remember the word of God and put it into practice in our lives. As we keep being told, these are unprecedented times. We need to reflect on what is happening, not just hunker down and get through it. Think about what is happening to us and how we are responding in the light of the revelation of Jesus. As you begin to do that, your Bible reading will come alive as you see the promises of God and hear more clearly his call on your life. The Spirit will reveal how God is at work in our day. This doesn't mean that you should read the book of Revelation like a horoscope to see what might happen tomorrow. Prophecy doesn't work that way. Only as we look back do we see the full significance. So don't waste too much time trying to work out if the fourth seal has been broken because if it has or not, Jesus calls us to live in the same ways, keeping watch, standing firm, or to put it another way, to live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. The overall message of the book of Revelation is that there are spiritual battles way beyond our comprehension going on all the time, and Jesus will win. The fact that there are plagues and earthquakes and wars doesn't mean that the plan has failed. It's all there, prophesied ahead of time, and Jesus calls us to keep alert and stand firm. The disciples didn't need to know beforehand what the significance was. They just had to follow Jesus and be obedient to Jesus. The crowds didn't need him sheets. If they'd not praised God, the stones would have cried out and the stones had even less idea what was going on. So rather than being distracted in pointless speculation about the future, reflect on what God has done in your life and in our community and do so in the light of Jesus who's been glorified. Then be led by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus. We will often not understand the significance of what we're doing until later, just the the disciples didn't understand why they had to go and fetch a donkey. They just had to be obedient. This week, I invite you to look back over the last two weeks. What's happened to you? What is the significance of what has happened in the light of Jesus? What is crying out to be prayed or done? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your victory. As we look back over the last couple of weeks and all that's happened, we pray that you would reveal the significance, that we would understand what you're doing and help us day by day to be obedient to you, being led by your Holy Spirit. Reveal to us how we should cry out to you in prayer and in action. Fill us again with your Holy Spirit, we pray. We declare, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. Amen. And thank you for, for that message, Chris. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, Mike has put together a worship set and there'll be a link to that underneath the bit that you clicked on for this bit in Facebook. 
Um, and then also, um, I would encourage you to join us for the Zoom coffee session. Uh, you should have received a link to that session. Um, we did it last week and you know, it's, it's not the same as all being together in the same room, but it's better than not doing it. And it was really lovely just to see people and have a coffee together over Zoom. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, so I'm going to close with a, a passage from Ephesians just by way of blessing. And it's from Ephesians chapter three. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our... Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Palm Sunday service. Good morning everyone and welcome to our Palm Sunday service and <laughs> good morning everyone and welcome to our Palm Sunday service we need him to fill us with his spirit and we need him to bring unity even though we're all in separate places right now and the cat wants to come in each and every one of us <laughs> It's not the outcome, but it's the ending that you have to make to leave the old transition, to leave the old, whether that's Burwell or Munich or somewhere in the United States of America. We just want to say you're welcome. Wherever you're tuning in from, whether that's Burwell or Munich or somewhere in the United States of America, we just want to say to you. When the Israelites, sorry, Describe that in a number of different ways. He said it was a state of affairs in which neither the old ways nor the new ways work satisfactorily. Father, we want to thank you that we can meet together in this new way, and we want to invite you into our. That's not feeling. This is our third online service, and um, we might even be be get. when Jesus was glorified. The glorification of Jesus is a key theme in John's Gospel, occurring 12 times. The glorification of Jesus is a key theme in John's Gospel, occur occurring 12 times. The light bulb moment for John and the other disciples was when 